Noble, who's standing in the back of the room. I was going to be the moderator today, and he said, you're the least moderate person I know. <laughs> so political views aside, um, I am Bill McCoy, and I'm from Metro Justice. My co-moderator, John Garlock, in the back with the jacket, is <clears throat> from the Rochester Labor Council, and he runs the uh, Education Committee, which is responsible for putting on this event. So uh, we welcome you to the second session of this public hearing on fair wages for fair work. The hearing sponsors Rochester Labor Council, the Pettengill Labor Education Fund, Metro Justice, the Workers' Center, and Power. Hope this hearing will heighten awareness of low wage work, contribute to an ongoing discussion of the issues, and most importantly, lead to actions to improve the conditions of low wage workers. We have presenters from several work sectors this morning. Let me introduce them. I can introduce Kim. <clears throat> Kimberly Ramos from Fight for 15. Uh, she's a manager in training at Wendy's. Then we have Erica Peterson, co-worker. Right. Uh, Michelle Payne from Healthcare Workers SEIU. Thank you for raising your hand. Um, and a uh, member of the Executive Council of 1199. <clears throat> Rachel O'Donnell here. Good to meet you, thank you. Uh, from SEIU Local 200, teaches political science and is an adjunct at RIT. Jack Bradigan Spula has taught writing and literature as an adjunct at several area public and private post-secondary institutions. Each group will have 20 minutes to make a presentation. There will be 10 minutes after each presentation for members of the panel of inquiry to question the presenters, okay? <clears throat> those, those panelists are Barbara DeLeo, former, former New York Civil Liberties Union Genesee Valley Chapter Director, and John Marcella, staff attorney with the Workers' Justice Center in Western New York. <laughs> Following the three presentations and the panel questions, there will be a question and answer period. If you have a question, please write it down on one of those three by five cards. Uh, limit yourself to a brief question uh, addressed to the panelists you would like to have respond. We'll collect them, and John and I will perform a certain edit function and uh, try to get all the questions in if we can. The session's being recorded by Andy Dillon and maybe Susan Galloway of Indie Media, whom we thank. Uh, at some point, the edited versions of these sessions will be posted on rochesterlabor.org. The written presentations and other materials uh, such as responses to the questions and so on, will also be posted there. Okay, a couple of housekeeping matters. You can have food and drink in here. The library does permit that. Uh, and at lunchtime, you can bring a brown bag or go across the hallway to Tim Hortons. Bathrooms are through the door here on, uh, I'm pointing to. Unfortunately, the door locks, so if you go out, you cannot come back in. You have to go all the way around. So, please write your name and address on the attendance sheet that is on the, sh on the table back there, and we'll share the results of the hearing with you. So, to start off with, we would like to have Kim and Erica make your presentation. Thank you. Thanks for coming. once before. I'm still nervous. Um, I'm Kimberly Ramos. I work for Wendy's on East Ridge. I am currently manager in training. Can you pull the mic down just a little bit? Oh, no. Thank you. Better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Did you hear anything I said? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm Kimberly Ramos. I'm a manager in training at Wendy's on East Ridge. Um, 
I have about a week left of this training. It's not so easy. <laughs> um, this is my coworker, Erica. Hi. She is a cleaner. So the same one of these. Um, she did not go on strike with us the first time. We have encouraged her to go on strike the second time. Yay! <laughs> Um, I guess we're just pretty much here to give you a little story about Wendy's and working there. Um, I've worked for a lot of fast food places, and honestly, I have to say Wendy's is probably the worst one. And just little things like, I guess there was an incident. Our, pay, our schedules go up Fridays, and we get our paychecks on Fridays. We can't pick those up till 2 o'clock, and our schedule's supposed to be up on the wall. And... I guess yesterday it was enough. And an employee came in at 4 o'clock to look for a schedule, and they told her, oh, it wasn't done till 4 o'clock, so she didn't get her schedule because she left at 2 o'clock, which is when the schedule should be up. Um, this is a constant thing, so we have a lot of problems as far as planning life, basically, because our week starts Sunday, so if the schedule comes out Friday or later, you have, like, no time for your week. So that's one of the things that kind of sucks there. Um, the way they treat us, uh, I've been in a number of situations. Um, there was the most recent one that I can't really talk too much about, but they kind of threatened me and like cornered me because of the person that I am. So it was a little uncomfortable. Um, but these things happen all the time. Like I've seen them happen to many of the employees there and their untold stories is how I see them. Um, some are worse, some are not as bad, but nobody outside of the work area sees them, and it's not fair, for one. I'm like 100% with the union, <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't wanna ramble on too much, but. Going from a crew leader to a manager, I literally make maybe $80 more a week in my check. And I probably do more work than anybody who makes less than me. Um, that also happens a lot. Minimum wage is $8, that is what you are paid. There's people who've worked there eight years, make the same thing. Um, one of my managers has been there 17 years, and he only makes $10 an hour. He currently has six kids, and he works three jobs to support him and his family. Um, he's a very big asset there, so losing him would be a bad thing for them, and so somehow they linger him on. I'm not really sure how, but um, just things like that aren't fair. We have a co-manager who had to go to another store because... They had threatened to fire him because he wasn't moving fast enough or he wasn't on their speed level as far as taking care of the store. Um, and because they threatened to fire him, he went looking for another job. And when they found out he was looking for another job, they moved him to a new store where I'm assuming he's doing pretty well. Nobody talks to him, which is another issue. <laughs> We're not allowed to talk to each other, guys. Do you believe that? <laughs> We cannot conversate. We have to ask to have drinks. We have to ask to go to the bathroom. It's like preschool. And sometimes they tell us no, and we have to wait like 20 minutes just to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Sometimes longer than that, they forget that we even had to go in the first place. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of those problems. Um, they don't like us to communicate with each other because that brings us closer together. And if we're closer together, then we go against managers. So they prefer to keep us separate. Um, I can say ever since strike, I don't see any of my normal crew members that I've worked with on a regular basis for like a year now. Um, we're all split up. I uh, barely know what goes on in their lives aside from a few texts here and there because schedules are completely different. Um, even me and her, we barely see each other. So. Um, no side conversations. If it's not about work, you're not to talk, pretty much. Uh, breaks, we'll start at 4 o'clock. First break is 6 o'clock. 
You have 10-hour shifts as managers, sometimes 11. Imagine coming back after a half an hour break, still having to work nine and a half hours without another break. They don't do the 10 minute break or the 15 minute extra break. We don't get those. You just work. It's just a constant work. Um, I had a run in with the GM about two weeks ago. Some of you guys know him, but he, uh, I requested Halloween off. And I had a doctor's appointment, but I wanted the whole day off for a personal reason. And it went on for about three weeks as to why I couldn't have the day off, because I was a manager and I shouldn't expect to have my request granted at any time because I'm a manager. So it's different rules, I guess, from being a crew member. Um, and then I was also told that Wendy's Corporation itself, its main concern is customer satisfaction and profit, which obviously leaves no room for employees or what they even care about us, um, which they don't. There's no, I don't know, there's nothing. They don't do anything for us. We don't get like McDonald's has like employee of the month or they get pins for an accomplishment. We don't get any of that stuff. We're lucky to get through a day with, with positive attitudes. A lot of them have negative attitudes and say mean things to people they shouldn't say and treat certain people a certain way and other people another way. Um, rules seem to only abide for what the crew members as opposed to managers. And just there's just a lot of unfair that goes on there. I've also worked for McDonald's, I've worked for Taco Bell, um, I've worked at many, many places. And even though some of them are low wage, they take care of their employees to a certain level. And I've yet to see that from Wendy's at all since I've been there. Um, it actually took me a year and a half to get this manager position and I was promised this after I started working there because I was overqualified in the first place. <laughs> Then I found out that after all the hard work that I had done in four days of cramming in computer training at home, um, I still had to wait a whole year for a position that still doesn't make enough and has twice as much work, more expectations, more responsibilities. Uh, it's a lot more stressful. Um, going into work is like a two-day prep. <laughs> I get two days off and then I don't have to go back to work until five o'clock the third day and I just don't want to go. It's just to the point now where it's just so unfair and so just not right. So I can't wait for strike. <laughs> and I am working on hopefully four new people, <laughs> including this one here. <laughs> Pretty much the only thing I have to say is that I feel that fast food workers have different laws and different, the, the general managers and the supervisors and the corporate offices, they follow a certain laws other than different fields. And I feel that it shouldn't be like that we have to work nine hours straight with no other break than our half an hour break when we work 10 hours. And that means we've only been working for an hour and we're on break. And we have no choice of you no know, saying anything. So there's different laws and guidelines that Wendy's has to follow, and they go up to the T with no cutting corners about it. And I think that the law should be changed for fast food workers and people with minimum wage. So that's pretty much what I have to say. I have something else to say, as always. As a manager, uh, when I close at night, we do all the paperwork and computer stuff and the labor. You go through the labor, which is what everybody works for the day, and you have to check their times. Now, we have minors that are like 17, 16, um, even 18, so they're a limited amount of hours. They, anybody who goes over that amount of hours, you have to fix their schedule so that they're only getting paid for the amount of hours they're allowed as opposed to the amount of hours they work because then we get a fine. 
<clears throat> so if you stay 15 minutes after your shift, you're really only going to be staying until 2 o'clock. So those 15 minutes that you stay, and it will probably be three, four, five times out of the week, you don't get paid. you're not going to get paid for. So I think that's crazy. <laughs> That and then we have the We Learn, which is another. It's a it's a Wendy's training on computer. It's picture. It's audio. It's all that. You're supposed to do that, like your first day of work, because it's like a pre-training for you to give you an idea of what's going to happen when you get out there. And they don't even give them to anybody anymore. I remember spending four days because they told me I had a hundred and one of them to do. And I need to get them done for manager. And I spent four days at my house on my own computer, and I completed every single one of them. And now all of a sudden, it's not that important anymore. And then we have new people who have no idea what they're doing, and it results into crew people yelling at them, managers yelling at them. They feel like they're being mistreated. They're being forced into positions they're not ready for. Um, they don't even know what a we learn is. Like, Part of my job as a manager, every week I have goals for certain crew people and different crew members have to do different kinds of we learns. Like if you're a sandwich station person, then you need to do the sandwich station we learn. They don't get this stuff. So when I mention it to them, they have no idea what I'm talking about. But yet, you're supposed to follow all the rules the way they're supposed to be and they just keep cutting corners. Like our turnover rate is unbelievable. I can't even tell you how many people come and go in just, just a week. An average week, we see probably six new people every single week. You see them, they leave. You see them, they're not here. You see them, they're suspended. You see them, they've been fired. They didn't miss, they're so whatever. It's just so ridiculous. And it's hard to keep a crew that you can respond, or that you can count on and trust. You know, because no matter where you work, your employees, that's what makes your job. And if you can't get along and do what you're supposed to, it's going to make the work day harder, which is going to make your job harder. So in our store, no matter all the crap we go through, we are all very strong in and outside of work. We all do currently hang out and have in the past. And these are the types of stuff they don't want us to do, but we do them anyways because we're people. <laughs> We are people, and they've done, they've tried very hard to break us down, and they still continue to try. But of course, I'm the big mouth and I'm the fighter, so I just do whatever I want, say whatever I want. <laughs> I'll talk to anybody I want about the strike. I talk to all the new people when they come in the store. I'm like the second person that they see, and I just throw it at them. Let me know how you feel about this place, you know. I had one new girl. Uh, Joanna, mm -hmm. she worked for like a week and a half. I think she only worked three days out of that week and a half. And I went to her, I said, so how do you like working for Wendy's? And she was like, oh my God, I don't. I'm like, really, a week and a half? And she was like, I like the, the crew, I like working with the people, but the job, I don't. She's like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever had to do in my life. I said, welcome to Wendy's. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell her. <laughs> I mean, I try to get people not to even apply there. Like anybody I know who wants a job and say you don't don't you don't want to work there, we don't want to do it. I've had two different. I actually had my cousin go. She got hired for the store in Jefferson, and she worked one night, a seven and a half hour shift, and she had to close. Her first night, they made her do everything that the other employees didn't want to do that night, and never gave her a break. And she works full time as a manager at a hotel during the day. So she worked that whole eight hour shift and went to go work for Wendy's for seven and a half hours and they didn't give her a break and they treated her like crap on her first day. Needless to say, she doesn't work there anymore. She's not that type of girl to fight. She just doesn't want any parts of that and I don't blame her. But she was just trying to make extra money. Thought she can get a quick part-time job and on her first day, she didn't even get a break for seven and a half hours. And nobody had nothing to say for it. And they knew she needed a break and didn't care. And then they gave her a check for seven hours. So she didn't get paid for the half an hour that she didn't get to use. And they do that stuff all the time. So 
yeah, six hour shift. If you work six hours and you go over your six hour shift by over, is it 15 minutes after? It's automatic half an hour lunch break. So whether you're there or not, and you got a lunch break or not, they're gonna take that from you. And this is a constant thing. Like every night I have to go through payroll and we go through the entire day of people and we have to adjust their time. Whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes, half an hour. If we stay late at closing, like we close some nights at one and some nights at 12. We're scheduled an hour after close to completely close the store. You stay later than that and you fall in that after six o'clock bracket, you will be clocked out for a lunch break even though you didn't get one. While you're spending your hour scrubbing and working very hard so you can get out of there on time. So, that's Wendy's, guys. Don't send your kids to Wendy's, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. Very, 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 very appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, have a good day. Well, I know it's 10.30. That puts us on schedule, but we did start late. Uh, in any case, uh, Barbara? I have a question, but I can't figure John? out how to turn the mark on. Can you hear me in the back? Ooh, yeah, okay. that one doesn't so work. So until they fix it. Um, first of all, I want to thank both Erica and uh, Kim for you, for sharing this. I know it's not easy to do testimony when this is not something you usually do. Mm -hmm. I am curious about how you live your lives. We've talked a lot about Wendy's, and I would certainly encourage all of you not to eat Wendy's anymore if you ever did. Um, but <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about how you make ends meet? You know, I mean, we're talking about really limited wages here, crazy schedules. How do you live your life? It seems like you don't do anything but work. Absolutely. 46 hours a week, every single week, as a manager. And that's her. I do 40. Okay. She's a crew leader, so she does 40. How do you manage um, it's just not, it's eating, not, it's, meeting your, your bills? How, how do you do that? You barely well, do it. Barely. Yeah. You, you barely do, you, do it. If you do it the right way, you have to like take some out every week until you get to the week that your bill is due, and then you have enough to pay it. I mean, uh, it's a struggle. Like, I have a car that I had to buy because I needed a car, and in one week, I have three bills that cost more than my paycheck, so it takes me three paychecks to pay them all in that one week. So it, it's definitely a struggle. Gas, um, I don't know a few of you guys know me, but I have turned into, like, um, Wendy's taxi, I don't know. I take everybody everywhere. I'm always driving somebody home. I don't like to leave anybody left behind anywhere. It's a lot of money in gas. Uh, normally I don't ask for gas. Some people give me gas, but that's just something I do. So, you know, it's definitely a struggle. I've heard we have a manager who's a co-manager who can't even buy food for her kids. She just told me because she paid all her bills on the first and cannot buy food for her kids. So she's taking, buying the leftover food at nighttime to take home to her children to eat. And I think that's absolutely crazy. Like, she's a co-manager. She's worked there for 15 years. And then we have the manager who makes bonuses off of us. So they're making money, and we just have to suffer, and they don't care. Cut our hours. You know, we'll schedule 40 hours. They'll take six, sometimes eight hours away. It's hard. It's definitely hard. It's not... Check by check. Is there, do you see that there are more women in where you work that are involved in this than men, more minorities, people of color than not? I mean, can you give us some sense of the demographics? Um, it's, it is a mixture. It's more females than males. Right now, currently, it's more females than males. Um, before that, it was more, um, it, more younger kids. It's, it's like the college and the high school. And, no offense to them, but they don't, their life struggle isn't the same as ours. I mean, some of them have it, but they have mom and dad in most cases. Like, the ones we know, they have mom and dad, and so they don't care. They're just there to buy sneakers. People like us, with kids and lives and bills and, you know, careers, this is it's just not, it's not fair, but it's not easy. And it's a fight every day, and this is just what we know because this is, this society, so 
we're used to it. You know, hard work has has just kind of become an everyday thing. And it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Yeah. Thank you. And I had a I had a a quick question. You mentioned uh, being kind and um, some of the employees uh, getting disciplined for things like trying to use the bathroom. Can you sort of add any background to the way employees are disciplined or given warnings or sort of treated when they do try to take care of you know? Discipline at Wendy's can go from losing hours, being threatened of losing hours, being suspended, um, and basically being, you get disciplined a lot of times in front of people, you get lucky to get pulled in the office. So anything that happens, the whole store knows. So it's kind of like embarrassment, I guess. I mean, to some people it is. I talk back, so it's not too much to me. (laughs) But, um, yeah, if you don't, um, we had a girl that used the bathroom, and they told her she couldn't go, and she had to wait and wait and wait, and then she finally just threw her headset off and walked out and went to the bathroom, and she was suspended for a day. And, I mean, it's just, it's just stupid. (laughs) Is there a mechanism for calling in to get your hours instead of going to the store? Oh, you can't do that. You can't call the store and ask for your hours. You have to be responsible to come in on Friday, whenever and I don't know what time. time she puts it up. But yeah, the time that she puts the schedule up is varies. Like, you know, it could be 2 o'clock. It could be 7 o'clock. It could be the next day. It, it could be the next day. Like, you know, yeah. you never really have a guarantee. I and mean, then when people call, for their hours, and they're told, no, you can't, but you should have, you know, came to the store and got your hours. Little do they know that the schedule wasn't up, and they get in trouble for it anyways. Doesn't matter. I have a question. Could you describe the timing system that controls the speed at which you work, from the time an order is made until it's delivered, and what kind of pressure that puts on? Pretty much when a car pulls up to the to order their food, the speaker, there's a beep that we get in our, our speakers. You have three seconds to answer it. Hi, how you doing? Welcome to Wendy's. What can I get for you? You know, and from the time that the person is ordering the food, it starts at one. Then it goes all the way until the, the customer receives their food. And the, the time that they want during the day, and it's a... a we have a busy, very busy, busy, busy <laughs> store, and we'll have our drive through all the way to Portland Avenue. And, you know, we'll have 15, 16 cars all throughout the day, back to back to back. And you were supposed to keep the time limit at like 1.15. Or less. Or less. If it gets up to 1.20 or 1.25, they, they're like, eh. But then once it gets to 160, they're, they're screaming at you. Like, look, what is wrong with this timer? Well, we have 16 cars, and they're taking about 300 nuggets and 28 <laughs> right. junior bacon. Or so they're ordering, or they don't know what to order, <laughs> right. and they're taking about a minute and 20 seconds just to order. Right. So that was pretty much, it messes up our timer. So I don't see how we can keep a timer when we're extremely busy. And half the time, it's not our fault. Customers sometimes don't have their money out of that when they have to pay for the food. So they have to search in their pockets, go in their purse, you know. So And it, those things are not our fault. But we get in trouble for it. We get yelled at because of the timer's bad. No, not just that either. We have headsets, guys. These headsets suck. Yeah. You can't hear anything. They can barely hear you. They're crap. And they, you know what they said? We're not buying you guys new ones because this store is too ghetto. You don't take care of them. Are you kidding me? Yes, that's what we were told. So we have these same crappy headsets from like 1995. Uh, they're so old. And they're like, oh, these cost $900. Okay, that was like years ago. So. But we're the number one Wendy's in Rochester. Right, right. We, <laughs> we make all the money in Rochester, but we can't get the new headsets because we're ghetto. We're city, inner city, and they don't give too much 
to us. I've gone, you know what? It's funny because I've gone to other stores like Jefferson and Lehigh and Lake Avenue, and I see a number of things that they do there that we're not allowed to do in our store, and nobody says nothing about it. They get to do whatever, from managers right down to the crew workers. Headphones on, doing whatever, not wearing gloves, or not even with proper uniforms on. And nobody cares. Come to our store and see what happens. Our store is the worst store ever. If you don't have a belt on, you're going home. Don't come back till you have one. That's it. It's that serious. You don't have the right shoes on, that's okay. We let some people walk around with the wrong shoes. Okay, till they fall, and then what happens? You know, we have a girl... We have a girl who has a, a learning disability. She's not even a girl, she's a woman. She's 43 years old. Christina, I love her to death. She has a learning disability. She was hired in this store with a learning disability. She was hired to make salads at Wendy's from 6.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock in the morning. That was her entire job. We have a new general manager and she treats her like crap. She threatens her, she takes her hours away from her, she talks to her any kind of way. I've had to pull her aside a number of times and tell her, you can't talk to her this way. I pulled her aside one time, one time, because I, I was just a star. I'm like, yeah, just, just how ridiculous. And they do this. It's, it's not like she came with a learning disability. We have other kids, I want to say, like 18 year olds and stuff. Like we have this one girl, Markea. Not really sure what's wrong with her. We know something's wrong with her. We're not sure, but you can't just, you know, come out and say that to people. So, we kind of lightweight with her. Then you got other people who want to yell at her. Why are you so slow? You need to be faster. You can't, this is fast food, you know. And I understand it's fast food, but you hired her. So, I mean, that's your problem that you hired her, knowing that something wasn't going to work out, and you still hired her. So now she's here, and she's got to deal with all the torment and the, the mouthy people. And it comes from managers, coworkers. It doesn't matter where it comes from. In that store, pretty much everybody has a part in anything. And it, you have to be, you literally have to like carry your heart on your hand to be that person for somebody to respect because it's, it's far and few in there. And I just happen to be one of those people that everybody loves because I'm very nice to people. I know how to respect people and I don't take any crap from Mary, from Pete, from Jim Fox, Rob Fox, whatever his name is. I don't even care. I don't take crap. I'm a person. I have rights. I have responsibilities. I have my own life to live and I don't need anything to get in the way, because I fought 32 years for my life. And they think they're gonna just knock it down, I gotta work 40 hours, I'm tired all the, 46, 46 hours, I can't even count. I'm tired all the time, I don't get to see my family, like this is my hometown, my family's here, I've a lot of family, I see them probably once every two months, if that, and that's just ridiculous, so. Gotta make changes here, guys. <laughs> I gotta go to work. I gotta be there at noon. Um, before we call up uh, Michelle, I want to say uh, Kim drove a van down to New York one night when we had the climate march. Drove the van down, took the subway downtown, marched in the parade, took the subway back, and drove all the way back to Rochester. I went to work the next day. And went to thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, Michelle, please. Uh, Michelle is a CNA at the Brighton Manor Health Center and formerly worked at Blossom, right? Yes. Okay, tell us about that. It's the same place. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michelle Payne, and as he said, I'm a certified nursing assistant at Brighton Manor, formerly known as Blossom. Um, I worked there for 16 and a half years, no, 16 years and three months. We are constantly short. The pay is low. I've been working at this place for employment, like I said, for 16 years, and I'm only making 12.69. And the reason that is, is because of our union. Without them, we wouldn't have what we have. Um, only God knows how much I'll be still making if it wasn't for the union. At one time, the employer had insufficient funds in his accounts 
and my check bounced. And I had to pay a fee. And I did not like that at all. I work hard for my money just like the rest of um, my counterpart stars. Okay, and um, as far as overtime goes, it's only after 40 hours. An employer rather work us short than give out the overtime. The only time we have overtime is mandated hours. If you're mandated to stay, that's the only time you get real overtime. As respect goes, there's not enough staff due to low wages, it's, and it's disrespectful, so there's no respect there. Okay? And for the break time, who has time for breaks when you're constantly short? You have to take care of the residents accordingly because it's not the residents' fault that, um, that we're short. It's the employer that don't want to pay up the money to make, to make it happen. Um, and trying to take care of the residents, you know, they see us and they know our pain. And they tell us, y'all deserve so much better. You know, and I stay there because of them, not because of him. He don't make me stay. It's those people that make me stay because they need help there. They're not getting the right things they're supposed to get. And it's not fair to them. It's not fair to us. It's not fair to no one. And it's a trigger down effect. As far as our health care coverage, he's paying 80% and it will go up 85% because, like I said, because of our, our union. And next year, you, and as far as making ends meet, it's a struggle. I have to split my bills in half, sometimes three ways. I'm always robbing the computer to pay Paul, and I have creditors calling for overdue bills. Sometimes I want to treat myself to a movie or spa treatment, because I definitely know I need it. But who can afford it off the salary I have? And to listen to my coworkers and their financial woes, they're working two jobs to maintain our g &E, put food on the table for their children. And um, speaking of putting food in my place, I don't have it. And, and it's sad because I'm 40. And I shouldn't have to rely on my parents to go to their house and eat their food. They're on a uh, fixed income. I shouldn't have to go there, but I do because it's hard for me. Um, I put, you know, I buy my, and when I do buy groceries, it's in increments every week. It's, I'm buying something to make sure I have something to eat for lunch, you know. And I feel as though this low wage in Rochester is going to put us in a more economic standstill, more clients will be to get money, and low wage should be raised 15 hours for everyone, not just for, just for the fast food restaurant people, but also across the board. Because everybody is struggling, everybody is doing things to make sure they get that money, and it's going to get worse. It got to. We have to make it better. And thank you. And that's all I have to say. Well, my doctor's appointments is spread out for three to four months at a time because of the cold payments being forty dollars to see the doctor, which is a lot. And uh, um, as far as other responsibilities, fortunate for me and unfortunately, I have no children, so I don't have so much responsibility like everyone else has. But as far as taking care of myself, you know, I have to put money aside to go to the doctor because, you know, it's too much. You know, it's extremely too much. And like I stated before, without our union, we wouldn't have as much as we have. We have our pension fund through the union. He don't want to pay for education. He don't want to, he don't want to see us rise up and exceed to what we can be. You know, and we have that just because of the union. You know, so it's still a struggle. Paid vacations? Oh, paid vacation like, through the union. Like, we, so, uh, me being there for 16 years and so much, I get like seven, um, three weeks, and I'll take it because I need it. You know, and it's paid vacation. You know, and it's by hours worked in years. So, 
Can you uh, speak to what, uh, I'm assuming that you were there prior to the union. Oh my gosh. And I, I would just like you to contrast like scheduling and did you experience any wage theft? You know, where people had, they were the young ladies before you spoke about working and not getting paid and being, get, you know, having their lunch docked from a, from a day that they didn't get lunch. So can you give us some contrast? Cause well, at one time I didn't, I didn't realize it, but you know, the labor board was called on, um, at the time, Blossom Man, a Blossom Healthcare Center, because people was they were doing the punches and they weren't getting paid for time work, so they were still in time. You know, they were taking the time from the employees and I uh, guess putting it in his pocket. And someone got on to it, and they called the labor board and they had to pay us like I had about two hundred dollars from that, and I was like, whoa, you know, I'm I didn't even know I was being treated that way, you know, and when the union stepped in play and I saw everything that was going on, I was like, yo, we should have had this a lot longer, a lot sooner. There was time before we had the union, he used to have agency come in to help with, um, you know, with the healthcare, with the residents and stuff like that. So he got red flagged because he wasn't paying the, um, the, 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 um, the uh, other people. And he promised us that he would give us a raise um, when he got rid of the agency. That was years before the union came, and then we looking like, where's the raise? It never happened. So one of the people that started to bring the union in, you know, because I didn't know anything about any unions, to be perfectly honest. And when she brought it in, I was on board. Anything to help people to get where they need to get to, I'm on board. And let, I'm telling you, we made so much strides, but it's still struggles. And without, without them, we would have never made it. Yeah, I can see that. Yes. What advice would you give your peers in other nursing homes I mean, to get them to understand that the union has a valuable role to play? In? I it's will to get to encourage them to organize. It's important, you know, because we... It, you struggle and you don't have to, you have to be together in solidarity. You have to do it. You have to be on board, same page. You were united, we, we stand, divided, we fall. Have you, have you found that your friends who are in the same profession are receptive to that message? Are they afraid? I, Why do you think it hasn't spread to more? I think it's a fear factor because they think that they're going to get penalized for standing up for themselves. And uh, as a young person, like even when I was a child, my parents told me I was a rebel anyway. So, you know, you have to fight for what you believe in, you know, and it's people just scared. They don't understand. And it's a fear factor. And, but once you get over that fear, it's all, it's all or nothing. Do you have any suggestions about how to help people? Because we have people in the audience that are working very hard to try to organize, and yet, you, as you said, people are afraid to come to meetings, they're afraid to speak out. What would you say to one person to try to change their mind? That's I suggest mean. you stop being afraid and do what's necessary to take care of yourself and your family. That's all that matters. Step up to the plate, do what you need to do. Never mind what you think is gonna happen. Just do it. Don't be scared. I'm never scared. And you will succeed in everything you do. God put us in a place to take care of one another. God will have you and he will hold you. And you keep God first and you do what you need to do, you will make it. Don't be afraid. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we have two people here speaking about the uh, uh, interns, uh, what do you call these? Adjunct. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies first. Rachel. Um, I'm a 
adjunct faculty member at RIT. Um, I've also worked at York University in Toronto, which is where I go to graduate school, so I'm going to kind of try to contrast those um, places for you because I come from um, a union background at um, the University in Toronto. Um, so I'm, I said I was adjunct faculty, and a lot of people don't necessarily know what that is. Um, instead of having kind of a full-time um, permanent faculty position at a university, um, adjuncts are people who might be hired to kind of teach one course here and there. Um, generally, it offers absolutely no benefits or job security. You don't find out that you're, if you're teaching next year or not. Um, so I was hired this term to teach um, an introduction to international relations class at RIT. Um, and I am getting paid $3,000 for the course. Um, it's four months long, and I spent about a month and a half developing the course before I started teaching it. Um, so I'm getting paid $3,000 for this course. I just got my contract for January, so I was hoping to be employed for another class in January. And I was also hopeful that the contract would come and say, like, oh, it's another year, you'll be paid a little bit more than $3,000, but no, it's also $3,000. And I'm developing an entirely new course for um, the department that hasn't been taught there in 10 years. Um, which is a lot of work, <laughs> um, and they're very excited to be offering it. I, you know, the chair of the department keeps telling me how excited he is. They're la offering Latin American politics at RIT for the first time in 10 years, and you know, thank you so much for developing the course. But again, I'm getting paid three thousand um, dollars for the course, and I will say that the tuition at RIT is up to thirty-two thousand dollars per student. So, for example, I have 27 students in my class, and I just kind of look at them and think, wow, they're each paying $32,000 um, to RIT. Um, okay, so what can I say? Um, so for each of these, of these contracts that I get, um, it's 16 weeks of teaching time. Um, so right now, my course is three mornings a week, so I go to campus Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I show up, I teach my class. Um, I don't know, it's a lot of work. Like I, I work every day to really kind of prepare the class um, because students are very demanding, right? They want kind of a full explanation of what what I mean by international relations, what this concept is. I have, you know, they have quizzes, they have tests, midterms, finals, um, they're writing essays. So I actually have them do a, a written paper every week. So I take home 27 papers and read them every week. Um, I've averaged, I guess, what I, um, what I work each each week, and it comes out to between 26 and, and 30 hours per week just for the course, and then I bring home um, about $170 a week for that, which comes out to about $6 an hour, I figure. <laughs> um, so I, I'm juggling childcare also, so I kind of rush to my class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then I kind of rush home um, because I have two small children, they're four and one, and um, <laughs> so basically my husband kind of jokingly refers to my job as volunteer work because anything that I make obviously goes to pay babysitters, so just so I can get to class. Um, so, I mean, it's not funny, it's not, <laughs> you know, I don't really, I enjoy teaching, I love it, I love interacting with the students, um, but not bringing home any money for it is really um, heartbreaking. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, so the, for the class preparation, I can only kind of afford the child care for the class time. Um, so for the class preparation, I do it late at night or early in the morning. I was up at 5.30 this morning to try to kind of email three students their grades for a presentation they had yesterday. I have a lecture on Monday that I need to write about global financial crisis, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, so I'm writing about kind of the history of capitalism and why capitalism is in crisis right now. I'm presenting a 50-minute lecture on Monday morning. Um, the students are, are very demanding, right? I'm up late at night answering emails. You know, I need to know my grade on this. I'm not gonna make class. Can I submit my assignment by email? Can you please post the lecture notes? Um, you know, some of them are angrier than that. <laughs> Um, I mean, obviously, these are people who are paying $32,000. They have a lot of demands um, on faculty. Um, yeah, um, I guess 
it's, it's a big shock to me because I have eight years of graduate schooling and I was working, um, I was teaching in Toronto um, where the situation is much different. We have a very strong union. Um, so each course, instead of being $3,000, is between $12,000 and $14,000. Um, and adjuncts are guaranteed three courses per term. So you can actually make like $40,000, like a regular salary, and you have benefits. It's not just kind of $3,000 here or there, maybe you'll get another one. Um, one thing that's really important in my union in Toronto is that um, they have conversion appointments. So if you've been an adjunct instructor for 12 or 15 years, what you hope for is that you get a conversion to a tenure track, meaning that you'll have a permanent position and guaranteed course loads and other benefits like um, vacation, um, other funding for conferences. So I think that that's ideal, right? Because the only thing you can hope for is that you'll have a permanent job and you'll be able to teach um, every term. Um, I guess I can say a little bit more about how um, my husband and I kind of make it um, the funny thing is he was actually, he lost a, an academic job last year and was kind of, is teaching at RIT also um, as a lecturer, which is kind of a full-time adjunct position. He was teaching three courses and he was salaried and had benefits, but again, it's kind of semester to semester to kind of figure out if he would be rehired. Um, he was in another department, um, but the pay even for that full-time job was so low that um, we were on WIC and food stamps temporarily and we were completely without health care. Um, which was very difficult because I had a baby during that time. Um, I mean, luck, we feel lucky that he's kind of started a new job um, and we do have benefits. But I mean, the kind of things that the fast food workers talked about, like paying one bill and trying to afford gas. Um, so RIT, I said, did offer me another contract to teach Latin American politics next term. And I just said, I'd love to teach it. I'd love to develop this course, but I can really only come to campus one day a week. Um, just because of the gas expense um, and coming three days a week, I really wasn't prepared for, you know, buying a, a tank of gas every week. So I'm really <laughs> looking forward to January um, when I can just go to campus one day a week. Um, I mean, I do feel like a lot of this isn't really fair to those students either. Like, um, these are students who want a fair college education and they're paying a lot of money for it. Um, and you know, I don't even have an office to meet with students, so the student will say, like, I really want to talk to you about my essay, or I really want to talk to you, I'm just really struggling in the course, and we kind of go into like a noisy coffee shop or a student lounge, or I hope that the conference room might be free for us to talk in. Um, just this week, I tried to meet with a student in all of these places, it was very busy, and the student was very emotional about not doing well in the course, and was considering dropping the course, and really wanted to talk to me. And I said, let's just find a quiet space, let's go into the conference room. And the Fidel Fidelity like financial advisor was there for the full-time faculty, and I just thought, well, that's kind of a slap in the face about like these people who are, are full-time faculty are trying to negotiate their retirement, and I just was kind of like, oh, okay, I'm doing the actual teaching here. I don't have time to meet with a Fidel Fidelity person. And anyway, um, they haven't found an office with me for me, so I don't even have a place to meet with students. Um, I do all my own grading. I do all my own lecture preparation. There aren't any teaching assistants or um, other people help me with the course. Um, I guess one thing that really struck me when the fast food workers were talking about was how exhausted they are, like how hard it is to kind of work for low wages and not have, you know, childcare, kind of, yeah, I feel, I feel that exhaustion. <laughs> um, especially with the kind of late night emails that students expect. You know, I often have to kind of force myself to go to bed and say, I'm not gonna answer emails anymore. I'm just gonna show up and teach my course in the morning. Um, uh, one other thing is that the, the contract is only for those 16 weeks out of the year. So again, the kind of preparation that I'm doing as far as preparing the class or, um, you know, kind of designing the class, it takes a month or sometimes completely unpaid work, right? Like I'm trying to kind of negotiate all of those things. And I, I do kind of dream of getting like some kind of full-time faculty position, but I have to, you know, write for journals, go to conferences, do all of those things that I can never really um, fit in. Um, oh, one thing. <laughs> According to RIT's website, the average faculty member at RIT makes an $80,000 salary, which 
I don't, I, I mean, yeah, so I guess I just have trouble kind of walking down the hall or going into my department and saying hello to people or, um, and I also feel kind of less than, right? Like I don't really interact with the faculty and I, again, I'm kind of rushing in and out to teach the course and leave, so um, I don't know. Like you kind of feel like <laughs> you're not really one of the faculty, but you're still um, doing a lot of teaching work and trying to kind of pretend to be a faculty member, at least to the students. Um, yeah, I think, I guess I think this is really on universities, and I think that one of the things that we need to do is just tell students, like, you're paying $32,000 and your faculty member can't afford to buy food, or um, just so they know who's doing the actual teaching and who's doing the actual work, and the parents who are paying that amount of money, right? Like, um, I'm sure when my parents paid my college tuition, or a big chunk of it anyway, they, they didn't feel like, um, you know, they had to question how many hours a faculty member might, might spend on me, right? This is thousands of dollars that parents and students are spending, um, and I think that's really key to kind of organizing and talking about what we should do about adjunct faculty crisis. I know that universities across the country are really moving to this, this model of, of hiring. <clears throat> Can I have a glass of water? Yep. <clears throat> and really trying to hire more and more adjunct faculty by contract semester to semester. Obviously it saves them a lot of money and they're kind of investing in, you know, big shiny gyms or, or other things. Thank you. So I guess it's kind of heartbreaking for me to see that, that kind of infrastructure going in and, and not, um, not supporting the faculty who do the actual education of those students. A couple of well, almost three years now, and uh, hardly a day goes by that I, I don't feel grateful for not having to be in that racket anymore. Um, I mean, the work was good to the extent that I, uh, you know, when I started adjuncting in my last phase um, in 2004. I mean, I really needed the work, so. It was uh, very useful for keeping body and soul together, barely. Um, but as I got into it, the problems um, and my negative reactions just kept on growing. I'd like to, uh, to tell you uh, first, because I mean, our time is limited here, obviously. There was a good run through of local adjunct. Uh, employment in the Democratic Chronicle just this uh, this past spring um, called Local Adjunct Professors Scrape By. It's by James Goodman. And it's a pretty comprehensive article. It has a lot of statistics about the local adjunct situation. And those of you who know Jim Goodman know that He's a solid reporter. Um, the number of institutions that we have here in the Rochester area uh, that employ adjuncts, I mean, there's, it's various. But um, there are a number that have most of the faculty members in adjunct status, most of the courses uh, you know, taught by adjuncts. Um, and that would include Finger Lakes Community College, uh, MCC, Nazareth, uh, and, uh, and there's some others who are below the halfway point but still employ significant numbers of adjuncts. Um, so you can get all that data, the, the data that Jim Goodman pulled out uh, was taken from um, an AAUP study. And uh, I don't think that the situation on campuses here has changed very much in, in a couple of years. So. But back to my own experience, I mean, I worked in academia quite a lot over my working life. Um, for a while, I was, my first uh, academic appointment, so to speak, was as a stacker at Sibley Music Library, just a few blocks from here. Later on, uh, that's when I was a student, 
and a grad student. Later on, I worked for eight years as an academic librarian there at Sibley within the U of R uh, library system. I also was a, a teaching assistant when I took my English degree at the University of Houston in the early 1980s. So I worked two years there, four semesters as a TA. And I'll tell you that the deal I had in Houston uh, as a TA was a, a lot better in terms of pay and benefits than what I experienced in the Rochester area, uh, you know, it goes uh, 20 years later as an adjunct. So I taught here at uh, MCC Damon, at uh, RIT, and at Nazareth College. I'm glad to learn that the uh, that the pay for adjuncts locally has you know rocketed into the stratosphere uh, around three thousand dollars per course. <laughs> when I was teaching only a few years ago, I was making around twenty-four hundred dollars per course at, at these institutions. Um, there seems to be, uh, and I haven't quantified this, but uh, within the, the or uh, between the various disciplines, there are some discrepancies as well. Uh, English comp and lit, my specialty, is really down at the bottom. Um, but even within the ranks of uh, adjunct English teachers, there are discrepancies. I know on, on one campus, having talked to uh, some of my colleagues, that people, you know, this wasn't based on uh, time and grade. You didn't get regular increments uh, as you went along, but they did pay uh, a premium for people who had uh, doctoral degrees. Um, which struck me kind of funny. I mean, of course, that's the, the way of way of the world, right? In academia and, and elsewhere. Uh, but the you know the job demands, the expectations are exactly the same whether you're teaching, uh, or whether whether you're uh, uh, you know uh, someone who has a master's degree or a PhD or no degree for that for that matter. Um, yet. The pay differential is built right into the system based on that degree. Uh, so there, there are a lot of uh, you know, discrepancies and injustices, large and small, in the field of adjuncting. I think the worst year I had, the worst year and the best year, simultaneously, was uh, around 2006-2007. I had uh, 13 sections that year from September through May. And um, my gross income uh, for that year was uh, just about $29,000. So when you figure it out, that it doesn't come to much per course. On top of that, of course, there, there are no benefits. I did have the, uh, the option of buying into the health plan at MCC. On the other campuses, I didn't even have, uh, I just didn't even have the option of, of a buy-in. Um, at MCC, because we were represented by NYSA, uh, we were included in the contract, we could participate in the health, uh, in the health uh, program there. However, we had to pay every penny of the premium. It worked out for me that I could get a better deal elsewhere, and that's what I did, so I didn't even participate in that. Um, there were, however, some definite advantages to have union representation at, at MCC in terms of uh, you know, monitoring workloads and, and uh, time outside the classroom that you were required to, to spend, things like that. So, you know, there were some, uh, as I say, some uh, real advantages. 
There was also the advantage of uh, some good advice. <laughs> the union president at that time helped me to get unemployment insurance one summer. Uh, now that's a whole other thing when it comes to adjuncting, since on the one hand you're not considered faculty, uh, but for tax purposes or for you know for financial purposes, the uh, colleges and universities uh, consider you as part of the faculty, and therefore you are, are not eligible for unemployment insurance on regular school breaks, particularly the summertime. Uh, there has been legislation introduced. There was some legislation that I think went into the Labor Committee and the Assembly uh, this past spring, uh, but I don't know of any movement on that front. But this is something that's come up year after year after year in terms of adjuncts within New York State, trying to, I mean, this battle between, you know, representatives of adjuncts on the one hand and the colleges and universities. And the colleges and universities just don't want to provide any opening for adjuncts uh, as, a, as a group to be able to access unemployment benefits for obvious reasons. So you have, on the one hand, you have this, uh, this business where you're, you're given a, a job for the next term, or you're promised a job. Sometimes it's in writing, sometimes it's a handshake followed by some you know, well or craftily worded uh, writing in the form of an appointment letter. In any case, you don't really have a solid gig. You could, you could be, as I was more than once, notified only, a, you know, weeks uh, before a course was to begin that there wasn't any work. Enrollment was down, so you were out. But you can't retroactively go and say, hey, I, I should have been eligible for unemployment insurance in these last three months. So you're, you know, you're stuck both ways. Now, the material side of things, it, you know, it's very easy to, to, to see how bad it is. As I say, if you read Jim Goodman's piece, which is filled with, you know, uh, much testimony from local adjuncts about <coughs> the rough situations that they have. Um, but there's also the, you know, the professional considerations, the, the matter of respect. Um, now, this is especially uh, important an issue, at least to, to my mind, because of the, you know, uh, the pretensions to moral superiority in, <laughs> in the academic world, right? I mean, next time you see those billboards about, uh, or, you know, is John Fisher still running those billboards around here about, you know, you know, <laughs> you know or, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the sloganeer, the old fashioned sloganeering in Latin, of course, uh, about what higher education <coughs> represents to the individual and to society. Uh, the whole idea of, uh, as, as they used to, to call my business, you know, humane letters. So that makes the, uh, you know, the situation of adjuncts within academia today even more uh, distressing on a personal level, especially. In the, in the world of English, uh, things have changed a lot. This holds for regular faculty as well as for adjuncts. Um, more, there's more of a base, back to basics movement in the world of English comp. It's not the comp and lit course that some of us may remember. Uh, the lit is not there so much. Uh, it's, it's more uh, mechanical in, in its approach to composition. Uh, as I say, that it, you know, it's something uh, that is teaching a, a style that is basically style-free, something that will be uh, very uh, acceptable to corporate uh, types, to uh, HR people, etc. 
So literature uh, is relegated to electives. It's also relegated to, you know, mostly to the full-time faculty, or they arrogate unto themselves, if you, uh, in academic terms, the uh, the right to uh, the privilege of teaching these uh, classes. So what the adjuncts get in the in the English departments today is, you know, all of the first and second semester courses uh, that were required courses in composition, college writing. It's often called, or something generic like that. There's also uh, I mean, another change that adjuncts feel especially hard uh, ha has to do with new layers of administration within English departments. I'm sure this is true in every discipline. So you have not just a department head, uh, but you also have a writing director uh, who is responsible for these composition courses and for the course materials that you are required to use with some flexibility, but it, you know, it depends on the particular campus and, and the individuals involved. But, uh, but basically, it's, it's pretty much an off-the-shelf kind of uh, programmed course of instruction. It takes all of the professional creativity out of it for you as an instructor. And of course, it puts you in a you know uh, even farther down the uh, the corporate hierarchy uh, in a sense because you have more bosses, um, so you don't have much you know uh, responsibility or control regarding course content. This is left to uh, in some cases, as it was at RIT a few years ago. Um, deals with corporate, you know, with big corporate publishers. In this case, it was Pearson, you know, to develop, to develop course materials that then you had to use somehow. So um, that that brings me to, I mean, my last point here really is that um, again, the colleges and universities are trying to have it both ways. They want you, uh, and they call you, and especially when they're talking to you in front of your students, you know, you are a professor or so-and-so, but uh, in actuality, your, your uh, job status is, is quite different. And they don't really want your, uh, you know, the benefit of your professional training and experience. They just want you to, you know, crank things out. It's a, you know, uh, sort of a, uh, an assembly line approach. So they don't want you to be involved in course developments on the one hand, uh, but then they justify your low pay in part by saying that you know, you're not doing work outside of strictly uh, in, uh, the instructional side of, uh, of the job. In the uh, Jim Goodman article, I ran across this quote here that um, uh, Jeremy Hafner, who's the uh, provost of RIT, was quoted here uh, basically trying to justify the pay differential between adjuncts and regular faculty. And quote, he, he said, uh, the workload for the two groups is significantly different. Full-time faculty have many additional duties related to scholarship and research, curriculum design and development, advising and service said RIT Provost Hafner. Well, that's true enough, but that really indicates, you know, the disempowerment of adjuncts on a professional level. Um, I, I could speak for a lot of adjuncts and say we would have liked more control of course content and so forth and greater degree of professional respect. We'd also, of course, demand to be paid for the extra time which is really what the issue is here with Hafner and others. I, uh, I'll, I'll just end by noting that uh, Hafner, in, uh, in 2012, pulled down 421000 uh, in salary plus 94500 in benefits. So um, that alone 
would be enough to raise my hackles when I have uh, when I see him commenting on the uh, the condition of adjuncts here. But of course, that'd be only the tip of the iceberg. So thank you. Rachel, you mentioned uh, negotiating um, for your next term that you would be going on campus once a week instead of uh, three times a week. Can you sort of talk about <coughs> that negotiation process and how you were able to sort of achieve that victory and how you sort of balance the fear of retaliation that other workers talked about in terms of bringing up terms and conditions of employment and sort of how you approach Really good question because I really want to teach this course. I think I was saying it's politics of Latin America um, and I feel like it would be a great experience because it's my major field and I keep applying for tenure track jobs um, all over the place and I haven't gotten any obviously. Um, but one of the things that they want to see whenever you're submitting these uh, faculty applications is you know what courses have you taught. So I really want to teach um, Latin American politics. So when I met with the chair um, to talk about the course that I'm teaching right now, which is an introductory course in international relations, I brought a full syllabus that I had developed. It's like a 12-page syllabus about Latin American politics, and I just submitted it to him and said, this is a course that I would love to teach. Um, and he said, yeah, this is great. Like, you know, we have, as I said, we haven't taught, we haven't had this course in, in 10 years. I'd really love to offer it. And I just thought, like, okay, here's my chance. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to say, like, is there any way I could teach it as a night course, an evening course, um, so I could, you know, avoid the childcare cost? And yeah, I kind of was negotiating in my head, am I still going to be able to teach it? Um, and I do right now have the worries that Jack talked about right now if people don't enroll in it. RIT only has about 40 political science majors, it's mostly a science and engineering school, and it's an upper level course, it's like a 500 level course, and I'm just thinking, like, I hope people register for this course. If you know anyone at RIT, please tell them to do it <laughs> so that I can be teaching next term. And I was only offered the one course. Um, I tried to negotiate for another section of the international relations course, and they said it wasn't available. So. I have a question. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you both because I think this is adjuncts are one of the jobs that are invisible low wage workers. You know, as Jack alluded to, the idea of the moral superiority. You know, 20 or 25 years ago, I was an adjunct and did not realize that basically it was intellectual factory work. I lasted one semester and decided this was not for me because I was schlepping all my materials, no place to store them, blah, blah, blah. But I think that there's sort of the seduction of saying, you know, you work for RIT or you work for ULR and therefore you don't get paid. What kind of talking points do you think would be helpful to other adjuncts to get them to understand at the, and value the, the uh, ability to organize and talk to each other. One of the things that I ran into was I didn't know any other adjuncts. I didn't see any other adjuncts. And those adjunct courses were offered at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7.30 in the morning. My class was at 4 o'clock, so I came after my other job. So I didn't see faculty, I didn't see anybody. I just schlepped in, taught the course, schlepped out, you know. So I'm curious about the talking points to sort of diminish that, you know, well, I work at RIT or I, I teach at U of R, mentality that sort of pervades this, these kinds of jobs, that they think that because you can say you're working at MCC or Finger Lakes or whatever, it justifies paying you less. Yeah, I'll just go first since I'm sitting at the mic. Um, I mean, I think there is a certain degree of autonomy that's present too. Like you often have control over your classroom, you interact with students, nobody's kind of lording over you, yes. telling you what your schedule is, or you know you can't cancel class, or you know you can't take it. I mean, obviously you have autonomy and um, you know a certain amount of privilege in that sense. However, I, I mean, one thing that um, that this low wage work is really becomes is because you're not on campus very much or you're not, it, it just kind of creeps into all areas of your life. Like I feel like I don't have a day off, right? Like I have to go home and check emails from students. I have to come up with a spreadsheet for grades. I have to develop a course evaluation semester syllabus. Like it just kind of branches into all aspects of your life so much so that there's not really a break time. There's not really a moment in which I'm not thinking about the lecture that I have to give on Monday or the grades that the students need or, you know, grading a stack of essays or exams or anything. And I think that's a huge talking point to just say, like, we need we need some terms of negotiation over how much this this course and these students can kind of creep into our, our lives, right? We need I was thinking of talking points with your peers. Well, I don't have a, a good answer in regard to the logistics of it, because, as you say, you know, people are 
people don't even see each other in a big campus like RIT. I mean, I never really met most of, well, I met a few of the faculty members, and I, I still have friends who are on the faculty there or just retired. Um, but, you know, for the most part, they never saw me and I never saw them. Um, there weren't very many opportunities for the entire faculty to get together. I mean, the, the regular faculty, and I, you know, air quotes around the word regular all the time here. Uh, that's, you know, the lingo that they use. But, um, you know, they have their own separate meetings in which policy is determined. And um, I'm sure this varies department by department. And, you know, of course, personalities can make a huge difference uh, as well. Uh, but there just isn't an opportunity on a big campus like that for adjuncts to really get together physically unless they make a special effort outside of the mechanisms or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the physical location. And, you know, there is a lot of that being done now, a lot more than even a few years ago when I was adjunct in, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that. But I will say that there's one thing that, you know, one big talking point that applies to academic workers across the board is that they have to get over this idea that they are uh, special somehow, that they're not really workers, or there's some, you know, division, there's this, uh, you know, a clear but invisible uh, dividing line between uh, groups of workers on campuses, particularly between support staff, you know, physical plant staff, uh, et cetera, et cetera, on the one hand, and then faculty on the other. Uh, administrations use this dividing line against the adjuncts, treating them in many ways that they're on one side. Uh, you know, for certain purposes, and for other purposes, as if they are among the elite. So um, that has to be broken down, and, and uh, that word, you know, that uh, uh, the category of worker is really important. It's important that, that adjuncts understand that that's what they are. Uh, that goes for other faculty as well, uh, and to approach issues in the workplace on that basis and with that understanding. I think as long as they're, you know, uh, uh, they're looking through those rose-colored glasses of, of uh, you know, uh, they're very deceptive elitism on campus, so they're not going to get too far. Thank you both. Okay, thank you both. And uh, remember there are the cards to be submitted if you have questions. I have one question here. Um, I can't help uh, but uh, make a point. I think Jack didn't quite come out and say it. Professors are workers. Just like janitors, just like construction workers, etc. I'm sure you folks know that, but it's you know clear that they're trying to make professionals think there's something else. Anyway, uh, get your questions up here. I have this question. I will read it. What is RIT administration's response to your needs, and can you voice your concerns? I guess I'm not really sure even how to answer that question. I have no idea where I would even voice my concerns. Like, I, I mean, the only contact I even have at RIT is with the chair of the department, and I just kind of had to kind of show up and say, like, I need to meet with you. I have no idea what I'm doing. I had to be shown how to use the photocopier, um, how to order textbooks for the bookstore, um, even to find my way around RIT. So um, <clears throat> I feel very vulnerable, I guess. Like, I wouldn't even know how to, you know, go to administration and say, look, do you know about all these adjuncts that are employed here? Like, I mean, I'm sure they know, but just, I mean, the invisibility of a, actual labor that's done um, makes me recognize, like, I guess the education that happens on college campuses, I feel like, isn't as important as, as the image of the school. I'm not sure. Um, 
Yeah, I wouldn't even know who to take my concerns to. <laughs> Other, um, again, I worked at a, a university with a union, um, and I was very involved with the union as far as bargaining and negotiations, and I have that kind of in the back of my head. <laughs> um, that I feel like if there were, you know, a faculty union or an adjunct faculty union that I could go to, it would be a much different situation. My, my information is a, a few years old in regard to RIT, but um, I know then, uh, you know, back just a short time ago, there, there were rumblings on campus about organizing. There was, uh, uh, I mean, some faculty members and the um, um, AAUP uh, chapter was, uh, was hosting some get-togethers. I attended a couple of myself, and uh, I don't know what, what came with that. I mean, you, you do have those kinds of contacts. Uh, within the departments, it's, it's a little trickier. Um, but it's not really different on, uh, on a tiny campus either. I mean, Nazareth only has, what, 2,400, 2,300 students or so, so it's quite a different world in that sense from RIT. Um, but there again, you know, there was, there were, there were no channels really. I mean, if you had someone who, uh, you know, who you could trust, you felt, who you felt comfortable with, who was also an adjunct or um, someone who was full time that you could talk to. But talk is cheap, you know. I mean, there were no real channels. There, there are no grievance procedures. There are no. Uh, you know, there's nothing of, of, of substance. Uh, the difference, as I said, at, at MCC, there you have, you know, a union uh, representative that you can go and talk to. Uh, there was a, you know, when I was at Damon, uh, the union had an office, a satellite office that was up there, um, you know, not far from the classrooms, and you could walk in anytime and, and contact. That's not to say that you necessarily get satisfaction with you know, bringing whatever problem it was uh, to the administration, but at least you had a channel. So there again, you know, unions are absolute, uh, absolutely essential. Okay, uh, I, I have a long three-part question here I'll save to the end, uh, but for Rachel, um, Maybe you mentioned this already, but and I, the Canada Union for Adjuncts. I just have to write something down to be able to ask the question. Um, at York University, it sounds like adjuncts have a decent situation there. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, bit about how that came to be, uh, because that's what we're struggling with. Yeah, um, okay, sure. Um, yeah, let me try to answer that question first. So York University has one of the strongest um, adjunct faculty unions um, in Canada. It's an amazing union. We have all kinds of benefits. Um, and they were able to organize about 15 years ago um, with, uh, with the largest union in Canada, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Um, QP and our local is 3903 and it's, um, it's an amazing union and um, I mean for example anytime I, I lost my husband lost his job at one point as I said and I applied to a, a ways and means fund that you know that they would supplement our income for like two months I mean just like thousands of dollars in our pocket that we wouldn't have had otherwise um, or I mean any kind of childcare help like I mean it's an amazing union so that we organized um, 10 or 15 years ago, long before I was there, but we've been an amazing campus presence. I mean, we've marched down in front of the, um, the administration. Um, we have support from the, the administration. Um, we have support from the full-time faculty. The union has combined kind of adjunct faculty with the teaching assistants who are graduate students um, who do most of the teaching on the campus. So, and this is a huge university. It's 50,000 people. It's in Toronto. Um, we. We're on strike in my time there. I've spent eight years at York University. We struck 
twice, I mean, these were months out on the picket lines um, to, de to demand a better contract, and we, and we got it. I mean, um, at one point, we were um, mandated back to work by the Canadian government, which was very offensive, um, but we were on strike for months. Um, and, we, you know, we have a lot of support. There are a lot of, um, I don't know, people like me who do political economy professionally, so we kind of um, have an understanding, I think, of how um, what we need to do to organize and, and pressure the administration to, to give us our benefits, and um, we've done it. <laughs> so I'm so grateful for that union. Um, should I take that question, or should I read that somebody has a hand up? Uh, Sorry, it's, it's a two-part. Oh, I just want is Canada special, <laughs> <laughs> or is York special, or could that could that conceivably happen at RIT? I think it could absolutely happen at RIT. I think we just need to organize and and say like these are this is look at this example. Look at QP thirty nine oh three in Toronto. Look at the benefits that they are able to offer their faculty, and look at the position of teaching on that campus and. Um, I mean, Canada is special in that education is, you know, the tuition at York University is 5000 a year, not 32000 a year. Um, you know, Canada has more public health care, you know, larger unions in more places. But that doesn't make it such an exemplary place that it can't happen here. I mean, absolutely. We have a long labor history, too, and I mean, we could easily organize all of the adjuncts and the graduate students together. Um, not easily, a lot of work, but it can be done, right? Um, okay, should I take this question? Sure. How secure is your job as an adjunct? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of hilarious, right? Like, obviously, I just said, um, you know, semester to semester, fingers crossed that I get a course that 12 people register for it, so they'll actually run it. Um, you know, they won't run any course smaller than 12, is what I've heard. But again, these are just rumors. I don't really have any actual contact with other adjunct faculty, so. Who knows? Does job security affect academic freedom? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, yeah, you don't want to be too critical about what you're teaching. I don't know. I, I feel like I had to make decisions in my course. Um, I'm teaching international relations, as I said. I come from kind of a, um, a left-leaning department um, that teaches a lot of um, kind of radical political economy, so I d definitely had to judge what I was going to present to students, especially very conservative engineering and science students at RIT. And actually, when I walked into the classroom, uh, there were only four women in my class, and everybody but maybe one or two people were white, and I was just kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't teach all these, you know, some people were in uniform, there's a big ROTC presence at, um, uh, at RIT, and you know, teaching in Toronto with a very diverse crowd, a lot of um, people come to Toronto as refugees. Um, I taught ESL courses a lot of times, specialized ESL courses, a lot of foreign students. And I just was like, I don't know how to teach all these um, really privileged people at RIT. So that was a big shock. And I definitely would say that I negotiate what kind of things I teach them. Um, I don't know. I hope that answers the question. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And important too. Yeah, before I read this question, I just uh, like the difference between Canada and here. Um, uh, now, again, you know, as, as a uh, you know retiree, uh, I've been out of the uh, this for a while, and uh, but I, as I understand it, the uh, the terms of the yeshiva decision are still operative, right? Yes. Uh, that I mean, so there's a there's really a, a huge burden on private uh, colleges and universities, uh, the faculties in those institutions. They are, you know, legally hampered by by this decision, which basically uh, says that you know the faculty members are. Supervisors are part of management, and therefore they are not eligible to form collective bargaining units. Um, now, that's only one side of the question. The other side is, well, how come faculties all over the country, the pri private institutions, don't raise holy hell and you know do what labor 
has done historically when faced with such uh, uh, legal impediments. You know, uh, so there, you know, there are two sides to that, but hopefully there will be movement towards removing the barriers one way or another to unionization of all of our campuses. Um, but uh, back to this question here, uh, how do full-time faculty feel about adjuncts? Are they aware of the challenges and disparities? Why don't they uh, stand up and speak out for change within, or, or uh, change with you? How can we make that happen? Well, you know, obviously I can't speak for uh, the feelings of full-time faculty, and of course uh, those feelings must be diverse. Uh, I do know that there are a great many people on campuses, particularly in, in some of the uh, departments where radicalism flourishes, uh, you know, like in anthropology and sociology, and even in, in English departments, uh, poli-sci, um, would like to make changes, but they're often, a, you know, they're a tiny minority of people who are even willing to speak out on campuses. Um, I do know that a lot of, uh, well, practically every faculty member, uh, full-time person that I have ever discussed the adjunct experience with has expressed sympathy, you know, well, for what that's worth. I mean, that's great, but uh, it's usually expressed in, in the way that, well, yeah, when I was uh, ABD, you know, uh, when I was ready to get into the, uh, climb onto the uh, academic ladder, you know, I had to put in six, seven, I've heard, you know, 12, 14, 15 years of adjuncting before being able to get a, a tenure track position. Of course, that's, you know, it's kind of ahistorical because, you know, today those tenure track positions that people glommed on to years ago, most of them don't exist anymore. So they, you know, they, this uh, climbing a ladder doesn't really work very well. Uh, also, there's, you know, I got to be, uh, I became very irritated hearing all of these, you know, war stories of, <laughs> of full-timers, frankly. As much as I realized they were trying to be sympathetic with me, um, it sounded to me like, you know, it was, it was like joining a fraternity or sorority and you had to go through a period of hazing, you know. Uh, well, I, I think this kind of hazing in the terms of, in, in the form of adjunct were going to be just as, uh, as much uh, outlawed as any form of hazing is. You know, if you're doing the work, you should be getting paid for it, and there should be uh, there should be equity. You know, across the board. That's what it comes down to. I just wanted to. I just wanted to say one thing about the way that full-time faculty feel about adjuncts. And first of all, I mean, very few of them pay attention or know that we're there, right? So we're kind of in and out. Maybe we're teaching a night course, as I mentioned. When I walk into the department, I don't feel welcome. I don't know anyone. I run in. I make photocopies and hope that, you know, nobody thinks I'm stealing them and run out, right? Um, but also, you know, I mentioned to the chair, I said I was really shocked when I got my contract for $3,000. And, you know, my old union, I would have made you know, twelve to fourteen thousand dollars, and he was just like, "Yeah, that is really shocking." Anyway, like you know, so that sympathy card also. But I will say, like a lot of faculty are extremely privileged people, right? Like they might come from a family who supported their graduate school education. They might have parents who are doctors or lawyers or faculty at some other university. I mean, I come from a very working class background, so just um, you know, my parents managed to go to some college. You know, they were in the military. They have a much different lifestyle, but. I mean, so you definitely feel that class division, and a lot of the full-time faculty will, you know, just assume that you're of a different class, perhaps, maybe you demonstrate that in some ways, but, um, or they just think like, well, you're not smart enough, right? Like, you know, I published 16 articles by the time I was 30, and I wrote a textbook, and, you know, they just look at you and think like, well, why aren't you able to do it? Not really putting that kind of class picture together, like maybe, you know, somebody with a lot of child care responsibility, or somebody with huge student loans who kind of work their way through college is much different from from somebody else. So I think that there's a huge class division with like the full-time faculty looking at, at adjuncts. So I just wanted to answer that. Thank you. Okay, that's a good follow-on to this question. Um, and maybe an audience member might help with this. 
What are the prospects for a union at RIT? What is SEI what is SEIU Local 200 doing? And what is RIT management's response? Okay, and, and then I'm gonna blend this other question in here. What happened to the Yale strike? Quote, will teach for food, unquote. <laughs> so, um, somebody from Local 200 might want to speak to that, or Jack, or Rachel. I can't speak to that. Okay, go ahead, please. So, um, you know, I would say adjunct action is a project of SEIU and a national campaign of adjuncts coming together, not just locally, but throughout New York State and throughout the country. And, you know, what, just one thing I else I wanted to mention is that, you know, adjuncts are the majority now nationally. So in 1960, 70% of all faculty were tenured or tenure track. And today, the opposite is true. So today, you know, 72%, I think, according to the AAUP, are adjuncts. So, you know, this isn't going away. It's only getting worse. And the only solution is for adjuncts to come together and, and organize. And, you know, it's in the early stages here in, in, in Rochester. Um, you know, not just at RIT, but other campuses in the area. And there's committees forming in Rochester and really throughout New York State to figure out how to, how to tackle this. And it can't just be one campus by campus, like at RIT, because a lot of adjuncts teach, in fact, you said you taught at a bunch of campuses, right? So we have to think about how we can organize all the campuses to, to control the market and really raise standards. Michelle's not here. We have a question for Michelle. She'll be back in a minute. Okay. Hey, can, can I just say one more thing? Like, when adjuncts organized, they're, they're winning. Like, they just wanted the College of St. Rose in Albany, and they're winning across the country things like better pay, benefits, and job security. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Please comment on the attitudes of SUNY deans such as mine, who said, quote, I want to keep my flexibility, unquote, when I ask for a contract after working as a part-timer for eight years. Anybody want to take ownership to that question? Let me try again. It says, please comment on attitudes of, and I think this is S-U-N-Y, okay, yeah. deans, such as mine, who said, I want to keep my flexibility. I'm assuming the dean, dean said that. When I asked for a contract after working as a part-timer for eight ah, years. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming that asking for a contract team. means people get locked into actually uh, fulfilling what they agree to do. And the dean wants to be flexible, meaning I want to be able to do whatever I want. I don't have to follow the rules. So. Like a Wendy's man. <laughs> Okay, anybody want to comment on that? No. Yes. I just want to, I, I wrote that card about the Yale strike. Yes. And there was a book I remember a number of years ago called We'll Teach for Food about that drug back in the middle Yeah. And that was a big deal once upon a time at Yale. And anybody in the room knows anything about what about Thank you. Okay, Michelle. Oh, we want to do, we want to do, and um, if you've heard some of the conversation that developed around adjuncts, relationships with full faculty members, etc., uh, you know, staff at, at, at the uh, colleges and universities, this question is aimed at. Uh, a similar situation in your work. So, <clears throat> are your relations with RNs and doctors similar to those of adjuncts with, you know, full professors? Well, we really don't communicate with the doctors like that. Oh, yeah, and then turn around and talk to everybody. Okay. I'm over here.
Well, we have doctors that come into the nursing homes and we really don't talk to them like that. We'll say hi and bye and that's about it. As far as the RNs are concerned, you got some of them that's, um, they okay. But you got other ones that they do above other people, you know, which they're not. So, you know, we try to keep it together. You know, they know that we exist, especially when it comes to me because my mouth is big, you know. <laughs> so they know that um, we're there and they don't, they don't try to disrespect, but sometimes they can be disrespectful. It's not what you say, it's how you say things to one another, you know, so. Any more questions? Any more questions while I'm up here? <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a, a system in place at uh, your home where uh, people can give you some tips? Because when my father died, he had the absolute best people taking care of him. And my mother wanted to make sure, because she knew they didn't get any money, that those people got some extra money. That nursing home made all his caregivers give that money back to the nursing home. Mm. And my mother was so upset. I mean, we're all so upset because he lived because of you. Right. And I don't know, do you, do you does that happen in your place that you? Do we get credit for what we do? <laughs> Only by family members as yourself. Uh -huh. And you got some um, nurse managers that actually say, good job, thank you, pat on the back type of things, but that doesn't pay my bills. No, they didn't. They, do you, does anybody ever try to give you a little extra money? And have you ever been told, no, you can't? We can't money? accept no gifts, none whatsoever. You know, and I feel as though if a family member wants to say thank you in any kind of shape or form, I don't think um, they have the right to tell them no because it's coming from the heart, you know. So they tell us, no, we can't accept anything, but I have some family members that come outside and say, you're not inside the building, so you can take it now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's on the hush, basically. I have a quick question, Michelle. Um, you didn't talk about your schedule, and uh, it was a big issue for the fast food workers. It's also, in a very different way, a big issue for adjuncts. Right. So, uh, what is scheduling? I mean, how much can they control your work life by uh, assigning you to shifts, or is that pretty much set? Well, my sh my shifts start at six thirty to two thirty, but I never get out on time. And if you over that amount, like say that you're seven minutes after the fact that you leave, you have to sign a paper saying what's the reason why you stay and. What time did you punch out, even though it's in the time clock? And the majority of the time, the reason why I stay over is because I'm still rounding on those people that need to be rounded on. And I'm also, we have a new system, we have a kiosk that we have to do by computers. And we're still doing that because that's how they get to pay by, the, their money by Medicaid, Medicare, and things like that. And if that's not up to par, then we're in trouble. So therefore, I'm still working. That's why I'm still on the clock. Trust and believe. I don't want to be there no more longer than I have to be. You have regular <laughs> Yes. From 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7. And every shift pays differently. Well, of course, I would like day shift to get paid a lot more because we do a lot more for the residents. But that's not how it goes. So, Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Talking to the lady up front, it seems to me that if a family would want to uh, be good to the workers that took care of their parents or relatives, it seems to me that if, if it was not accepted to compensate them, I would personally go to the managers, to the owners of the place and rip them. Yeah. Because uh, in, in order for these people to do anything, in order for them to make their money, it's coming off their backs, and if they're giving good service, I would I would want them to say, hey, why don't you give them higher money, higher wages? Why don't you treat them better? I know. And I My think mother it, did. Okay. Yeah. And I think if yeah. more if more families would do that, yeah. maybe they would think about it. Right. 
And also, let me add that, you know, the supplies there that I work, there's hardly any. My, my thing is, I like to feel good, so why not make those people feel good? So what I do, ever since I've been working there, I buy my own soap and powder for these residents so they can get the best care possible. You know, because they don't, they deserve so much better that they're getting, and they're not getting, they get it through the people that actually care. It's not the person that actually owns the place that cares. Because he can barely name the people that work there. The only reason why he know me because of my mouth. You know, but as far as the residence is concerned, he don't even know half of the residents that's there. You know, and that's shocking because they're paying his wages also. He's getting grants and everything. And he don't even know them. You have one resident that shot him an email, you would think that he would respond back to him. No, he didn't. You know, and that's sad. It's really, really sad. You know, and they don't deserve to be treated that way. We don't deserve to be treated any kind of disrespect either. We're making money for him. We're providing service for him. And therefore, he's reaping all the benefits and living lovely, going wherever the hell he want to go, on his damn private jet, and his fucking Mercedes, excuse my French, <laughs> and it's pathetic. It pisses me off, and he's getting on my last nerve. I'm sorry, I had to rant. <laughs> hey, that's okay. We speak French, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any more I, questions? I have a question that hasn't come up, and really for any of the presenters this morning, about non-compete. Like, if you were to choose to go to another setting that paid more, do you have anything in your employment contract or, or verbally that would prevent you from taking a job? if another place was organized and was paying better, a non-compete course. I mean, we usually associate those with, with other kinds of jobs and business, but I understand that for some people, they are not allowed to go to work for the competitor. Uh, I don't really know about that. Okay, so you haven't had that experience. No. How about Jack or? Okay. I know, for Bruce one thing, no. I'm sorry? Who's is shaking his head. We don't, we don't see that. We don't see that in this area. Okay. Not in health. Okay. But in, but in other areas we see. University researchers, that's... Uh, A little louder, Bruce. Uh, you, we don't see it in healthcare, but university researchers, um, you know, U of R recruits a lot of medical researchers. We right. have the service, we represent the service workers there. So it doesn't affect our folks, but there are uh, a lot of um, non-disclosure and non-compete things in their recruitment of research and techs over there. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions before? Okay. I can hear you. Yes, 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 yes. Without the union, we won't be anywhere. Right. You know, so I'm all for unions. I love the union. I love my union. Everybody should love their union because that's the way we're going to get ahead in life. <laughs> Y'all be blessed. Michelle, thank you. Jack, Rachel, thank you. Barbara, John, thank you. Last night we had some cool stuff. We had Vince Arvalo, Jeff Kostansky, and Jim Bearden talking. Uh, it was great. This afternoon at 1 o'clock, Jake Allen from Local 200, Bruce Popper from SEIU, Jeff Kostansky again, and Luis Torres from the Worker Center are going to be here. Hey, come back. 1 o'clock. Thank you.